I ping you on Twitter, right? Okay. Hey, hey. All right, don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. Sit back down. <laughs> uh, we have another amazing panel. I don't know if it'll be as spicy. Okay. Uh, So uh, the next panel is going to be a global rise in consciousness. Uh, first up, I'm going to bring out my friend John Vallis. Where are you, John? Yes. There he is. Love the shores, man. Uh, next up, we've got Ella. Is Ella off there? Hey, Ella. How are you doing? Uh, Toma, it's Toma, hey. Uh, uh, we also have er er Eric Kaysen, oh my God. How you doing, man? Joe, are you, in, are you moderating this? Oh, it's, it's not on here. Oh, so we have Joe Nakamoto moderating this. So last person. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. I am, in fact, moderating this panel. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Boa tarde. How are you all doing? Are you ready to have your faces melted by the Global Rise in Consciousness panel? Now, we're going to structure this as follows. We're going to start off with some introductions. I'm going to try to play devil's advocate about why Bitcoin might not be a change in consciousness or spirituality or whatever it may be. And then we're going to dive deeper into this topic. Um, but to open up for a quick question, I'm going to ask my panel to do a raise of hands. Has your consciousness been altered by Bitcoin at any point? Just raise your hand. Okay, four from four. What about you guys? Has your consciousness been altered at all by Bitcoin? Is right that on. Like half the room, maybe? Half the room? Okay, we're going to try for the other half today. My opening question for you guys is, I want you to introduce yourselves and then explain to me if the Earth's core was the depth of the rabbit hole, where are you on that scale? So for example, my name's Joe Nakamoto. I love to make Bitcoin content around the world and to ch challenge some of the notions about Bitcoin that we hear online. In terms of the rabbit hole, I'm probably sitting somewhere around the mantle of the Earth's core. What about yourself, Eric? Where are you on the rabbit hole of this Earth's core? And could you please introduce yourself? Uh, hi, my name is Eric Kaysen. Uh, I wrote a book called Crypto Sovereignty. I've been involved with Bitcoin for about 12 years. Um, uh, some people would say that I'm quite deep down there. Uh, I don't know because I don't really think it actually ends. So uh, I just know that I've been in the rabbit hole for long enough that I know it's not going to end. And I've been here for so long that most people on their journey down seem to encounter me along the way. So. Eric is covered in magma, in my view of this, this um, analogy. Take it away, Tomer. Okay, uh, yeah, hi, I'm Tomer. I've been involved in Bitcoin for about 11 years, so not quite as long as, as Eric, uh, but I've been tumbling down the rabbit hole ever since I first heard about Bitcoin. I feel, I, I feel like I've gone, <laughs> it's hard to say how deep down, but I've gone so deep down that I lost sight of the normal world, and then come back up, and then gone back down in, a, in again. So. Uh, but it's been pretty hot, and I don't recognize anything around me anymore. Wow. Okay, that's, that's deep. All right, Ella. Yes, hi. My name is Ella Huff. I am still in college. I'm a junior in college now studying Bitcoin, which is very exciting. So I'm going to get further down the rabbit hole over the next year and a half. Um, I also work Generation Bitcoin, which helps students learn about Bitcoin. Um, but where am I in relative to the Earth's core? I feel like one of the greatest gifts I've learned from Bitcoin is the knowledge and how every day I think I kind of know less and I get further down. Um, so I was class of 2021, so still early. Um, but yeah, very grateful to keep going further and further. Fantastic. Any other class of 21 in here? Class of 2021 Bitcoiners, anyone? Raise your hands. You're in, you're in good hands, Ella. Fantastic. And finally, of course, John, where are we in the Earth's core? Well, hi, everyone. My name's John Vallis. I, uh, podcast occasionally and I'm, I'm trying to write a book about all this stuff right now so my my brain is very discombobulated for that very reason that the rabbit hole seems to have no end so perhaps the analogy is not so great because the earth's core the top of the earth the the, the earth's surface and the earth's core gives you parameters to determine yeah. where you are and i think we're all realizing that the rabbit hole is more like a wormhole you know there's no real end there's just a shift to a different place and jeff 
explained it so well in his recent talk, and it's uh, the further you go, the more it affects you, the more it impacts you, the more it changes you, and the more you have to reconstruct your perspective based on whatever Bitcoin might be as kind of a constant in your consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so uh, where am I? I have no idea. But as I sit on this stage with all of you, in front of all of you, I feel like I'm in the right place. So. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> I think you're probably quite close to Toma, though, I think in terms of, but you can probably shout his name, he'll hear you. Okay, so I'm going to start off a little bit spicy here. Bitcoin is just money. There is no spiritual awakening. There is no rise in consciousness. Bitcoin is hodl technology that lets you get rich, and that's when you buy a Lambo, and then you buy expensive plane tickets to celebrate with your rich friends at Bitcoin conferences around the world, such as this wonderful place we find ourselves in. It is just a financial awakening. There is nothing more to it than that. Would any of you like to try to counter my argument here? Toma? I mean, I'll twist your words on you a little bit. You said Bitcoin is just money. And I agree, as opposed to fiat, which is unjust money. And <laughs> and that makes all the difference in the world. Because when the game of money that we all live by, the very thing that we put our energy into and work into, is an unjust system, then we live in a world where injustice prevails, where the incentive is to be the cheater, to do unto others before they do unto you. And that's really what's wrong with the world right now and what's going to be so fundamentally different that it has Jeff Booth up here saying we can't even imagine it. To think that we've grown up in a world where we can't imagine what a just world actually looks like because we've all lived in fear of injustice and you know, we, we've either been ignorant of the injustice or we've been hypocrites and perpetrators of the injustice. So to, and, and this is what I think you start to see is so powerful about being around a group of Bitcoiners, people you can trust, people who aren't in a system that's unjust, who are building a system that is just and can love one another without fear of being betrayed. It's a lovely, lovely sentiment. Um, I'm going to delegate to Eric here. Bitcoin is just money, man. What are you talking about? Well, I jump in, and so, so you presented the whole number go up thing, and uh, I'm of the opinion, look, like my number hasn't gone up. One Bitcoin is one Bitcoin still. Um, so if somebody's looking to cash out, have their Lambo, go fly around to Bitcoin conferences, like they're, they're still in fiat world, they still see it as fiat. And what Tomer was pointing out is that like, this is about a fundamental shift in understanding what is money. It is just money, just money. And when we actually shift our consciousness to understanding that money is the fundamental object that connects all of us, when we start to understand that when I engage in exchange with you, there's actually a secret third party that's involved with that, and that is fiat. And fiat having the classic Latin root of by decree, that's what it is, is in the exchange, by decree, our governments involve themselves as a third party in all transactions and shave off a small sliver of that, and they utilize that small sliver that they shave off to then go perpetuate their endless wars, to create their borders, to create their surveillance, and to engage in a global process of of abuse of all of humanity to say that you don't deserve privacy, you don't deserve freedom, you don't deserve li liberty. You must live inside of our systems that we give to you by the decree that we choose to have you live. So I think it's very important to understand that this shift in understanding what money is is quintessential and important because most people have never actually taken the time to sit down and think, what is the difference between a just money and an unjust money? And how does Bitcoin bridge the gap between those two? Okay, no, it's a very good point again. I want to, I want to really dig deeper onto this point, though. Would, would either of you two like to rebut some of my arguments there a little bit more, or can I try a different tack? I wanted to add a little bit more. Please do. Because I've been talking or thinking about this a lot now that I'm talking to my peers and other students about what is Bitcoin. And I think a lot of us are probably familiar with the diagram of it takes 10,000 hours to understand Bitcoin. And I calculated, I think I'm at six, but I think it's probably more than that. Um, I think it's okay if Bitcoin is just money for you, uh, not just in that sense, but <laughs> how I've been increasingly think about, 
I've been thinking about money is it as um, sovereignty capital. So, and I think we can talk about this later on, but I just wanted to preface that I, I do think it's okay if for some people it's just money um, over time. And this brings up the whole idea of lowercase b Bitcoin versus uppercase b Bitcoin. If you come in and it's just money for you, just lowercase b Bitcoin the asset, I think over time, and you know, we're talking about consciousness here, you experience unlocking the treasure journey, you experience this rise in consciousness and you begin to appreciate uppercase b Bitcoin, the network, and it becomes more. I love that. I've got a lot of friends who are lowercase b Bitcoiners, and then a lot of friends, like my peers on stage, who are uppercase b Bitcoiners, who have that sort of higher range of consciousness. Okay, one common trait I've noticed among Bitcoiners is the ability to speak more freely and more honestly about spirituality, about, you know, it might be, you know, psychedelics, it might be an openness to discussing feelings and emotions, which is quite strange when fundamentally this space is a nerd space, you know? It's, you know, we're getting excited about some lines of code on a computer screen. Um, but within that, there comes this almost uh, kookiness or strangeness to the Bitcoin space, and you're just talking there about how you discuss with your friends. Is there a risk that you need to be a little bit weird, a little bit off the wall to really grok and really understand Bitcoin? And if so, then to what extent do we alienate people who aren't a bit off the wall and a bit aren't you know, happy to you know, wear loud shirts and you know, talk about spirituality in open spaces? Quite a long question. Do you want me to reiterate it or you got it? Well, I actually want to point out that the off the wall and wacky idea is what normal world has given us, that we are supposed to tolerate indefinite taxation and theft in order to perpetuate endless wars, and that us bring up the idea of, hey, may, maybe we shouldn't be engaged in systematic theft that allows for the fundamental human rights abuses that allow for, you know, I'm, I'm American, like my countrymen, and my country has funded a trans-global war against 52 different nations over the course of the last 70 years. We've killed hundreds of thousands of people, and all of this has been done illegally and unconstitutionally. And when you bring that up to, to out in normal world, that, but like that, that is the radical truth that's going on. And like that, that's the weird freakish thing that we have normalized in such a way that we don't have a very serious and real conversation about what does it mean that we are a globalized society now that has the opportunity to use a new form of money that nobody else can control, that we can use to give self-sovereignty to all people if they choose to have that, and we can actually fundamentally change the concourse of the direction of humanity so that we no longer have to be using a form of money that perpetuates infinite wars that enrich a small class of individuals at the expense of all of humanity. That's the weird and freakish thing. You're all fired up already. This is great. Um, would you say that fiat has given rise to a global rise in unconsciousness then? I mean, that, that to me was where I was going to go with, this, uh, with okay. this issue of awareness. The awakening, and the reason it's called an awakening, is because the fiat world has deemed as normal that we're all the same, and we're all obedient, and we all obey the fiat decrees that, that exist. The normal condition is for every human being to be very different uh, and from one another. And in being different from one another, we're all weird relative to, to one another. And, and realizing that you're different from somebody else and expressing your originality, your uniqueness, is, is this awakening. And so, of course, the earliest people to ex behave differently from the m m homogeneity of everybody else will seem weird in contrast. But wh what's weird is everyone behaving the same way when they're all actually really different people. And what's normal is everyone behaving the way that they truly are, which is very different from everybody else. Okay, okay. I'm going to switch to John now. Now, in your appearance on What Bitcoin Did, they actually titled it The Bitcoin Awakening. And uh, Ella actually quoted your piece uh, in Notes on Truth and Freedom as part of this research. So you've affected and you've influenced other Bitcoiners with your own awakening. But can I ask a personal question? How did the pre-coiner pre John perceive himself? And how does Bitcoiner John perceive himself? It's a good question. First, I just want to touch on your initial question very briefly. Please do. And say that a lot of people say, even people in Bitcoin say, like, Bitcoin is just money, settle down, particularly to us philosophers in Bitcoin, if you can call us that. And my rebuttal to that is always, nothing is just anything. If you find something useful, 
that means that it's useful to you to move towards something that's valuable. So implicit in every single thing that we find valuable is our ideal. Where do we want to go? Who do we want to become? What kind of life do we want to have? So we might look at the plunger in the bathroom and be like, okay, that doesn't have much capacity to move us forward. We, we want it because if the, if the toilet backs up, we don't want that to disrupt our day, so we want to plunge it out and move forward, right? Everything is either something that prohibits us or empowers us to move towards what we deem to be most valuable. And that is always a perception of ourselves in the future and the people that we share this environment with. And so the, to touch on another one of your questions, you know, like, do we, is it off-putting sometimes if we're so crazy about Bitcoin and the people at the top of the funnel? What I think is so profound about Bitcoin is that it works on every level. It, it speaks to that implicit ideal, what we find valuable, no matter where you are on that proverbial rabbit hole. So you may be at the very top, and Bitcoin may just be money, but as has been said, that's no small thing in the world today because money is so broken, it's not performing what it's supposed to, which is supposed to give you optionality to move through the world to that ideal, now and into the future. And when that stops working, we are not able to move toward the ideal. We are not able to actualize us, ourselves the way that we want to and we should be able to. And so then you go down further and you keep asking, like, okay, the plunger only has one real utility. What is the full utility of Bitcoin? Okay, it's money, it helps us move through the world, with world, plan for the future better, secure our future. But then we go down a little bit lever. It's like, wow, in trying to uh, contextualize and understand this thing, we, we, we wind up in these fundamental questions of truth and freedom and sovereignty. And what do these things mean to us? And what do they mean for our own conception of ourselves in the future? To your question, you know, your most recent question, it's like, well, before I looked out on the world, and I saw a lot of things were messed up, and I became very despondent about that because I didn't see an easy way for all that to be turned around. Not even an easy way. I didn't see a way for that to be turned around. You know, you have the military-industrial complex. You have corrupt politicians. You have, uh, you know, broken systems of government, broken systems of money, broken financial system, the pharmaceutical industry, blah, 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 all the way down. You know, everything is corrupt. And I didn't see how the Titanic could be turned around, so I became a gold bug which is a very depressing thing to be because, you know, <laughs> gold has already failed and we know that story. And so the punchline was, well, you're just hoping for Armageddon and that you can exchange, you know, a, a chip of gold for a piece of bread. That's not a very hopeful vision for the future. And so even though I tried to be the best person I could be, you know, it, you, when you don't have hope for the future, when you can't see that idealized version of yourself in that future, the world gets darker, it gets smaller, you get smaller, you become less ambitious, you don't treat yourself in a manner that is moving toward the very best version that you think you could be. And I know it's cliche, but if we're not trying to do that, what are we trying to do here? And Bitcoin, in attempting to understand it, sends you down that rabbit hole, and all, in order to understand Bitcoin, you have to consult all these other areas, right? Philosophy, economics, monetary history, history, to really try to get a grasp on it. And that process alone is very, you know, it, it, it develops you personally, it expands your perspective, it gives you a better view of the world. So I would say that my interaction with Bitcoin has given me both the intellectual uh, firepower, or it sent me down these intellectual uh, rabbit holes, and has given me the, the courage to actually speculate, wonder, investigate who it is I want to be in this world, connect with others who are doing the same, and really attempt to make my own responsibility for who I'm becoming be the you know, the thing that I contribute to turning around that Titanic. We can't all have the big, you know, the outsized impact that, a, you know, some of the people on this stage during this conference have had, but we can try to be the best that we can be and connect with others doing the same. And I think as this is showing, as you walk around and speak to people, that's a pretty powerful thing. And as Jeff said, I think we're in the future already. People always ask when it's happening. I think we're there. We just have to keep expanding this out and doing our own job to, you know, to move toward our own ideal as expediently as we can. Yeah. I, I like Bitcoiner John more than Precoiner John. I like him way more too, yeah. Good. Um, any gold bugs in the house today? One. Good on you, man. But you're at the Bitcoin conference, so you're in the right place. Um, now, Ella, when I was 19, 20 years old, I was actually using Bitcoin, but probably not the way that you're using Bitcoin right now. 19-year-old Joe was on Silk Road trying to raise his consciousness. 
thanks to this wonderful tool. But, you know, as, as the young person on this panel, um, I'm actually really jealous because I'm usually the young person on the panel. Um, you know, to what extent do these kind of ideas resonate with a Gen Z audience? Do you, do you find you sometimes struggle with them? And it kind of ties into what you were saying earlier about the little B and the big B thing. Like, how do you effectively communicate these kind of ideas to a younger audience? Yeah, I think part of it, it's not verbal communication always. It's through action. That says a lot with communication. Um, how I sometimes frame it, and maybe this is my own personal Bitcoin thesis, is I think the 21 million Bitcoin are tools for the 21st century, and I think all 8 billion people can use that tool in a different way. Um, and so when I talk to my friends, I don't really start at this point of Bitcoin's going to lead to a rise in your personal consciousness, because, you know, when I found Bitcoin in 2021, 2020-ish, like it went completely over my head. And I wouldn't have said, I'm unconscious. I was, if someone you know, looked at me and said, oh, you're unconscious, this tool is gonna help you be more conscious, I would have, that would have turned me away, so I don't go there. Um, but I think what can be helpful also, when you're young, people look at you and they ask you, what do you wanna be when you grow up? And I don't think that's the right question to ask also. I think it's better, you know, you don't need to know what you're going to be, what role you're going to have, how you're going to do it, when you're going to do it, where you're going to do it. But I think the better question is why? Like, what are your personal values to what John was saying? Who is the type of person you want to be? Um, so I think that's more important. And, you know, later on with my friends, maybe we'll get there, but I never start <laughs> with all of this. Um, it kind of comes later. Totally get it. And then, for the record, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. And that's good. I think it's good. Like, I think we'll have many different careers. Like, I love the term multi-potentialite. And, like, you never could have asked if, like, I could never could have predicted years ago that I would be here. Yeah. And look at you now. This is Bitcoin proof that it changes you and elevates you, and it does lead to that rise in consciousness. And also, I guess, just a quick point to add, because you both kind of were discussing this earlier. Right now, we have a base layer in society that is full of dishonesty and kind of contributes to an unconscious nature. But I think if we're building a, war, a world that has a, a bedrock more, a base layer of honesty and truth, my opinion is that it's inevitable that it will lead to a greater rise in consciousness, and we'll get that. Yeah, and actually, that's a really good segue, thank you very much, for a question for Toma about your article, The, Legend the Legendary Treasure of Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> oh, we've got a few fans in the house, wonderful. Now, in this essay, I'm going to have to read here because I wrote down a way too long a question, sorry in advance. So, you, you make the case that Bitcoin, beyond being a digital currency, initiates a profound spiritual awakening for many, challenging conventional beliefs about money, power, and identity. But before we get to the idea of this awakening, please could you talk us through this idea that you also bring up in the text, which is about purified money. Yeah. Um, so I, I make the case that Bitcoin, the study of Bitcoin, going down the rabbit hole, gets us to ask the question, what is money? What, is, what exactly is money? And in asking that question and seeing Bitcoin as an alternative to what we've been told is money our whole life, we get to see that money isn't what we thought it was. Money isn't something that is issued by the government. It isn't something that is decreed to us. It isn't pieces of paper. It isn't even tangible, right? Like, it could be anything. And we, and we have to ask ourselves, what is pure money? And, and Bitcoin presents itself as this candidate for being pure money, money purified, money extricated from all these contaminants, central banks, governments, corporations. It is issued by nobody. It is in control by nobody. It is, it is pure money. And when you get to see what pure money is, I think for many of us, the conclusion is, well, mon money that we thought was evil or tied to greed or tied to selfishness is actually just this instrument that honest people can use to mutually trade their time and their energy for the efforts of other people's time and energy. And so we find that money is, in fact, good. Once we purify it from all these contaminants, we see that it's a good thing. And we feel this, and it, to me, the, the enlightenment that it brings is the enlightenment that so many other things that we think are evil or distorted, when you purify them, you see that they're okay. Like, education isn't the degree-granting institutions and curriculums mandated by central authority. Education is learning what you're passionate about. Health isn't eating the food pyramid and popping the pills that you're told to take. It is 
figuring out for yourself what you uniquely have, what uniquely makes you feel well and makes you feel, uh, adds to your longevity. And this goes on and on and on, because and we live in a world where all of these things, all of these important ideas are completely tainted by things that have their arms, their tentacles wrapped around them. And when we purify them, we can pursue real education, we can pursue real health care, we can use real money, pure money, uh, to use it. So that's, that's what that notion of purification comes in. And I think that is, that's a big part of the spiritual awakening, when you realize this world I live in is not, is not the pure world, and the pure world is actually a good world, and I can extricate myself from all this evil. And you can. You can opt out. You can. Now, there was an interesting thread of individualism coming through there in the way that you explain things and that the idea that it's, you know, what you, what you find is best for you and the passion that you can then apply that to. Um, to what extent is this global rise in consciousness affected by Bitcoin, which tends to favor, I mean, individualism in the positive sense of the word, not in the negative sense. And within that, how can you have a collective rise when fundamentally Bitcoin makes you more you? You know, Bitcoin made John more John. Bitcoin made Ella more Ella. So how are we going to get a global, a collective movement when fundamentally it's, we're doing what we think is best for ourselves in this new system? Yeah. Maybe I'll just fi I'll finish on my point. And let it, I, I think this pursuit of purity, you ask what pure money is, what pure education is, you eventually get to the end of the road which says, what is the pure me? And that's a question that only you can ask. And I say that, I mean, I'll give away for those of you who haven't read it. That's the true legendary treasure of Satoshi Nakamoto. It's the ability to go through this thought process to discover what the pure you is and be the pure you. Like, and that's different from what pure education is, because we may all agree on that. But what the pure me is is not what the pure Eric is. It's not what the pure Ella is. We each have to discover our own selves. And that's the greatest treasure you will ever know, is who you truly are and then being able to be who you purely and truly are. That, that's the treasure. It's fantastic. Are you pure, Eric? Well, I think uh, connecting the individuality to the global consciousness, like what Tomer's talking about, this process of purity, it all begins with the process of questioning. And, and even if it's as, as superfluous as the question of what is money, that's a fundamental shift from being told what is money, in the same way that you're being told that you are this individual, you are your career, you are the son of you know, your parents or whoever. And it's so important that through this process of questioning, we actually begin the process of purification that can only be done through proof of work. The total other perspective is a proof of stake one where other people tell you how the world is supposed to be. They tell you how you're supposed to be. They tell you what is normal. They tell you what is successful. They tell you how the world is supposed to be. Whereas we're asking you to say, question what the world is supposed to be. Question who you're supposed to be. Question what is wealth. Because through that process, you will begin the proof of work to actually start purifying yourself. And you realize that these are the same questions that actually collect that connect us to a much larger global consciousness. And that's part of the deep hunger that everybody has. They experience the, the depth of the deadness of nihilism of this world. That inability for you to truly seek out the mystery of what it means to live and exist. You're told, don't ask these questions. Work your job. Go home. Have your kids. Go to school. Do all of the right things. And that that's supposed to make you happy. And yet so many of us are absolutely miserable. In the United States, the only thing that kills more people than suicide is drug overdose. Think of how much we must be suffering as a people. And this is the world that we have been told. Maybe what we need to do is actually question this world. And how about we question the entire operation of how our society operates together, and that is money. That is the thing that connects all of us more than anything is money. And when we can start actually questioning what that is, we can start questioning who we are in this society too. And so in that questioning, we not only discover more about ourselves, but the, the extraordinary thing is we start to discover that other people have this yearning too, to know who they are. Who could I truly be if I was free from needing to go to the fiat mines and try to make money so that I can just survive? What if I truly actually had a deflationary money that accrued true savings over time. What could I do if I didn't have to work my nine to five? Who could I be? How would I want to show up for my world and my community? And I think that it's through this process we truly begin the process of purifying ourselves and cleansing ourselves from the fiat world that has told us who we're supposed to be to start discovering who we want to become. 
And for me with Bitcoin, I've transformed myself from somebody who was scared, alone, nihilistic, and suicidal into somebody that I'm becoming bigger than I could ever thought. And my truth is, is that it's not me as an individual, but it's who I get reflected from all of the individuals here. And when they come up and say, thank you for saying these things that you did, please keep saying what you're saying. It allows for me to become braver and more conscious about who I want to be, and it allows for me to put that courage out there. So. I hope you are asking yourselves these questions. Ask yourself now, you know, what is the purest version of me? What is pure me? Can I be like pure Eric? Not like Eric, but like your own version. Don't be like Eric. He is his own pure self. Okay, I want to kick on a bit more with this individualism versus collectivism um, thought. And forgive me in advance, I'm going to be a bit pro-state here, but you know, it's, it's for the purpose of a discussion. So. With us all becoming more pure individuals and all being the best version of ourselves, to some extent it erodes the state and the utilitarian nature of the state. I often debate with my 18-year-old brother, who is far smarter than me, and he will always take the contrarian argument to whatever I say. He's not at all orange-pilled, but of course I buy Bitcoin for him. He thinks that you know, if we carry on with this Bitcoin path, we're going to end up with all these empowered, financially rich individuals who might have the power to usurp and dismantle these institutions. A second point to this is that we've been coached to some extent by the fiat system, and when large events such as the pandemic take place, we are not only coached, but we're instructed how to behave for you know, a period of two years. For, for two years in the UK, where I'm from, it was hand space, space. It was follow these arrows, follow those arrows. It was this is how you behave in public. And some people are still shaken by this uh, experience. The state also has some good stuff about it. Um, it has some good stuff about it. <laughs> Someone help me out. Um, point being, Individualism versus collectivism. What does it mean, say, 10 years and 15 years from now, when we have all these empowered, awakened individuals who are you know, economically and mentally free minging around? Are we going to see less of a state? And is that a risk? Is that a bad thing when the next pandemic comes along? Someone help me out here. I, I just got to interject here. Like, we're thinking in old and classic terms of these isms that don't exist anymore. If you go back 50 years and ask somebody, hey, we're going to have this internet thing, everybody's going to connect it, they can communicate it all, they're like, what kind of crack did you smoke? That, that, that can't exist. So, so it's really important to understand that what's going on is truly transformational because Bitcoin embodies this radical individualism where if I have my private keys secured correctly, you can never get my Bitcoin, period. But at the same time, it is the total the totality of the network that is collectively enforcing the ability for that. So what I see is in philosophy, there, there's a Hegelian synthesis going on of these two extreme tensions that are now being synthesized into something new. And it's so important for us to abandon these old perspectives and ideas of what statism is to see that like this is a chain that holds us to an old world in the same way that the chains of monarchism held back the world that came before the revolution. And in the same way that the American Revolution was individual men were empowered and decided to say, this old system no longer serves for our new world that we have discovered and we must break the chains of bondage from that to choose to create a new form of collectivism that works better for the people. And I think we're on the precipice of this move, but it demands that we actually utilize Bitcoin, the internet, and cryptography in a thoughtful and sophisticated way to start building the political systems of the future that will abandon these ones of the past and that will look radically different from anything else that we have seen before. And it's no longer about a debate between individual or collectivism, but it's a debate about the old world versus the new world. Okay, yep. yep. John, could, then we'll get to Toma. Say two things about that. The first, you know, in so many of your questions, I, you know, because we've been wrapped up in this conference the last two days, I relate to my most recent experiences here. And the first is, when you say individualism, I think sometimes people think isolationism. And that's not at all the case. I think individualism is becoming as strong, as sovereign, as secure, as confident, as integrated as you possibly can as an individual, so that you're more available for all of the things that you can contribute to your community, your family, your, you know, the group of people that you most relate to. And again, this is such a great example. 
Because when I meet so many people around here, I mean, first of all, it's a giant hug fest all the time, right? <laughs> So it's not people that are looking for things from you. It's not people that are, you know, we're not dependent upon each other. We can really meet each other as we are, right? We can, we can talk about big ideas. We can enjoy each other's companies. We can do all those things because we are not so codependent. We can choose to be selectively if we want to work on a business together, if we want to work on a project together, but we, the, the necessity is not there. And I think that's because we're so... Uh, secure, sovereign, we put so much thought into this ourselves that it makes us more available to, to hang out with each other, to build relationships with, with, each, with each other, and so much more. So I think that that's one of the, the big differences between individualism. I don't think it's isolationism. Um, and I think that's a thing that gets you know, mistaken a lot in the world today. No, big up that. And also, who has hugged John today? Has anyone hugged John today? A few hands go up. It is a hug fest. <laughs> I, I really like the idea of uh, sort of stealing your phrase, radical individualism through community. Right. And the, the last thing I wanted to say is, you know, as you come into the uh, libertarians were the first kind of cohort to really grok Bitcoin. And we hear a lot about like socialism versus capitalism versus communism. And we have to first understand that none of these things are in their like even theoretical form out in the world today. You know, people will say, oh, like Americans cap capitalistic. Really? You know, with a fiat currency and, it's, and the government that employs 30% of the population or whatever it is. I mean, we don't have those things. But I, I don't think it's good to make those, you know, ideas the basis of how we talk about these things. I think that the more we take responsibility for ourselves, the more we establish freedom for ourselves, the less we allow others to steal from us, as Jeff mentioned in his talk. That just means the system that is unjust, that is doing those things, that is perpetrating those things, atrophies. Maybe not on the timeline that we want. This is all probably going to take longer to, ha to effectuate on a mass scale. Again, we have to recognize that we can do it in our own lives and in our own community, community much quicker. But I don't get bogged down in these debates of like anarcho-capitalism versus socialism versus collectivism. I think if we engage in, the, in the, the solutions of freedom, if we engage in just technologies that will allow us to take more responsibility for ourselves and establish more freedom in our life, then the, then the institutions that would seek to violate our sovereignty and freedom, they, they atrophy, and they'll find their level. I don't know what that is. I don't know how big the state should be. I don't know what responsibilities it should have. I understand the arguments from the anarcho-capitalist perspective and the socialist perspective and the communist perspective, but I don't know what it should be. There's so many variables involved. I just know that if we're able to live as just lives as we can, and we're able to secure what we think is most valuable, and we're able to say no, to anyone who wishes to violate the things that we think are most important to us, then we're in the best situation possible to not contribute to the sustenance, the persistence, and the growth of those things. And in fact, I think in the case of Bitcoin, because governments are the size they are today, because of the theft they're able to perpetrate, I think it will simply atrophy, and at some, you know, it'll just continue to find its level the more people who opt into this solution that is Bitcoin. Yeah, it already feels like it is atrophying to some extent. I mean, just to uh, play on what you were saying about you know, the different groups within Bitcoin, it is already a broad church and it's just getting bigger. I mean, you know, we had a book last year called, or two years ago called The Progressive's Case for Bitcoin. I know that Knut Svanholm is now working on The Fascist's Case for Bitcoin. So, you know, it's, I think he was joking, by the way. At least I kind of hope he is. <laughs> Toma, you wanted to come in there on what Eric was saying there. Yeah, I'll, I think what... I'll use a couple of examples here to make a broader point than I was going to, because I think the other point was made. It's like when we are presented with the choice of individualism versus collectivism or socialism versus capitalism, these are very often what, what are best referred to as false dichotomies. It's like it's, it's either this or that, yeah. and that, those are your only two choices. And the reality is, is that there's often a third choice or a fourth or fifth choice, and these two choices are presented as bad choices. The notion of individualism as selfishness you care only for yourself, you don't worry about others, versus collectivism, somebody else cares, takes care of everybody else, el eliminates the choice for you realizing that the best way to take care of yourself and everyone else is through cooperation, collaboration. And so I think Bitcoin casts aside a lot of these false dichotomies by presenting something that works in practice. Like the, I'm, I, I've attended so many debates between capitalists and socialists, and they always go, 
Socialists make the case for socialism. Capitalists laugh at them. They say, don't you see socialism everywhere it's been implemented has led to poverty and ruin. And the socialists say, well, that wasn't real socialism. Yeah, yeah. And then the capitalists say, capitalism, look at how great it is. And the socialists say, well, take a look at all the cronyism and corruption. And the capitalists say, well, that isn't real capitalism. So what we have is both sides saying, in an ideal world, my system is terrific. In practice, I admit it, it's never implementable. So we have these ideals that can't be put in, together in practice. But when you have Bitcoiners talk about it, Bitcoiners aren't, like at some point we'll have the ideal version of Bitcoin. We, we agree Bitcoin, isn't, Bitcoin doesn't work today, but it, it, Bitcoin hasn't really been tried. We believe in Bitcoin the way it is and leave it the way, leave it, the way it is. And I've seen debates between socialists and capitalists who are talking, debating about Bitcoin and they ultimately both come to this agreement, Bitcoin is fine the way it is, and we think it supports socialism because we love it, or we think it supports capitalism because we love it. It is a system that works in practice, and, and you can see it working in practice. It may be ugly, it may be confusing, but it actually works, and I think that's, it, it, it drives through and breaks down these false dichotomies that we're constantly presented with. Exactly, and you know, whether we're a... Um, whether you're a socialist and your toilet is broken, or you're a fascist or a capitalist and your toilet is broken, Bitcoin is the plunger that will you know, help you out there. Um, so we're now in the year 2048. Ella is still a young lady. We are getting our brains cryogenically frozen. What does this world look like? Have we achieved this global rise in consciousness to address the title of this panel today? Big deep breath from Eric. Uh, so this is like as if when I wake up year 2048, Bitcoin has been successful. Yes. Uh, the world's radically different, you know? Uh, we, we all have self-sovereign LLMs that we keep. Our Bitcoin private keys are part of the same system that operates these. We have sovereign algorithms that seek out information for us. You know, but cost of production from the perspective of just boost world, it, it's a pretty free global society, but also cost of transportation has been so thoroughly lowered. I can get from Tokyo to, to I can get from Tokyo to London in three hours. Most people are highly mobile. Uh, you know, some people are Android, some people are cyborg, some people upload themselves into cyberspace. You know, we have a colony on the moon, we're working on transit between Mars. The Martians are fucking pissed, all right? This is important to understand that, like, Bitcoin cannot operate on Mars, so they are fucking angry. Um, and, like, that's going to become kind of the, the interplanetary conflict that we have to deal with. And this is very important to understand that there is a hash horizon that is 10 minutes light speed outside of Earth that can never reach Mars. So Martians do not get Bitcoin. They find this highly bigoted and it's gonna become very problematic. But here on Earth, like stuff's pretty great. Everybody has resources. It's pretty peaceful. Uh, think of kind of the expanse reality. Uh, and so like, it's just like a big wheel, you know? Like even though there is going to be a rise in global consciousness, we are going to become more free. We're gonna lower the pro cost of productivity across the board. Food will become more profound and, and for available for everybody, will be at a population of 30 billion. Stuff will be pretty good here on Earth. We run into a lot of the same conflicts out in space. And then we'll solve that on Mars, and the same thing will happen in the outer planets. We'll solve on the outer planets, same thing's gonna happen at Alpha Centauri, and it's just gonna go on and on until we get to the end of entropy. Okay. Can I chime in for a second? You absolutely so. can. <laughs> Bring us back down to Earth, please, Ella. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I try to be very optimistic, and so I'm going to go a little off-brand here and maybe be a little pessimistic, but I have looked at the, like, the cycles of global reserve currencies and the past financial crises, and they were kind of overlapping around 2049. So I, I get the question, but I don't think 2048 is... I think it's further out where we start to see, you know, a lot of what Eric was just describing. So that's my pessimism bit. Um, but what I think is really hopeful about Bitcoin is that it restores your agency to think and to focus on the hard problems. And so when we get into more of the, I think, further past 2048, we will have the ability to focus on the hard problems that really matter in life. And so when I'm, I would be 45 then, um, you know, I don't think, just like we don't have dollar conferences today, people have talked about this. I think in the future, like, I guess what I'm trying to say is, um, it, it allows you to think about everything else that's not just Bitcoin. Like we can, I'm, my whole life probably will not be just on Bitcoin and that's a gift that we can think about other topics and other areas as well. Yeah. Why will it not be 2048? Why, why will it be later than that? 
Um, okay, I'm going off memory because I did this a while ago, but I was looking, about every 100 years, we have a new world reserve currency, and it depends when you start when the dollar was. Um, but then when I was looking at also, at least in the U.S., the past financial crises, they cycled in about 40-year periods. And when I was mapping those, it was around 2049. So, who knows? This is like past performance doesn't <laughs> imply Bitcoin's going to break all, all your models. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, exactly. But I just, I, I think 2048 maybe is a little early for what we really hope and what is coming. But I think it's coming and that's hopeful. No, I like that. I, I wanted to actually segue into talking about some doubts um, because we have been very optimistic. We have been very forward thinking. And it's one of the reasons I love the Bitcoin space. It's full of optimists who generally think we can build a better future and we're doing our best to do so right now. But surely you must have doubts sometimes. You know, I'm constantly trying to test these Bitcoin mantras and to not trust verify all this stuff that we talk about in conferences and to actually see it in the real world. And let's be real, like very few people grok Bitcoin, you know, a bit more are familiar with it and, you know, a bit more still recognize the Bitcoin B. But then there's a large swathe of people, and I've got the receipts to prove it in terms of video evidence, of people that can't pronounce the word Bitcoin, don't know what the Bitcoin B is, and they certainly have never considered what is money. You know, this is one of my doubts, is just that we're nowhere near where we think we are in terms of awareness and understanding of Bitcoin. But what about you guys? Surely you have these doubts and these, you know, uh, thoughts at the back of your mind. <laughs> I, I'm going to push back. I, so I don't. And the reason why is it's not because of Bitcoin, it's because of the question of what is Bitcoin. Okay. This is all a grandiose thought experiment that has given rise to a new form of consciousness because we have solved a very difficult, seemingly unsolvable problem through a sly roundabout way using cryptography. And this is why my book, my book is called Crypto Sovereignty and why I focus so deeply on philosophy is that this is a fundamental advancement in philosophical thought that allows for us to solve the most endemic problem that humanity has ever had. How do we have economic exchange where violence is not an implicit part of that? That has been solved in the same way that we solved it through other technological advancements like the wheel. Once the wheel was solved, it turned out that we can now like roll shit on carts and it makes transporting stuff way easier. We solved that with what Satoshi Nakamoto gave to the world. So even if it turns out that there are fundamental flaws in SHA-256 that allows for it to be cracked by, say, quantum computing, we've still figured out the technique of being able to apply cryptography in a thoughtful way that allows for us to solve the problem of the Byzantine's general problem, which, to be clear, while it's a computer science problem, it is also a problem of war. To me, that this is what it is all about. We have finally solved the paradigm of how to break the idea of money's relationship to violence and that relationship to economic. That is something that we can't roll back in the same way that we figured out with language that we can actually construct meaningful phrases with each other. Because like this is all actually a linguistic thing that is happening, that vis-a-vis -vis cryptography, we now have essentially a super language that allows for us to be able to verify things in a binary way that we can say with absolute certainty we know that's true or with absolute certainty we know it's false. And to me, that's why even if Bitcoin fails per se, we still have the form of thought that solved this that is so quintessential and important to the problem that I don't, I don't frankly care if Bitcoin fails. What I care about is that we have solved this intellectual problem that has haunted humanity for so long and that's why also in my book I say that Bitcoin is messianic. Because if we can truly grok the fact that this, this solves this problem between violence and money in a way that has never been solved before, it fundamentally transforms the entire scope of what is possible for humanity, and that transforms our consciousness as well. A compelling point. Well made. John, doubts. Surely, surely there are some doubts. I'm, af I'm afraid I'm going to have to give a, a similar answer to Eric, but not for the same reason. You know, Bitcoin has, uh, I guess, given me an insight on, you know, what it means to expect or believe in something. You know, the premise of your question is almost like, no disrespect, but like it's highly materialistic. And we'll say, well, we'll just step back and things are either going to happen or not. Maybe it's fatalistic in a sense. And I think the more time you spend in Bitcoin, the insight is your participation Acting as if something is true really matters. And I think we could all probably find a very simple example in all of our lives, but we're related to Bitcoin. And I, you know, we did a documentary with the guys at Bitcoin Beach, you know, and we told that, that story. And when you act as if 
the world could be better. When you act as if there is good in the world and good in people, when you act as if truth is real, whatever your religious sensibilities might be, when you act as if God is real, how does that influence your behavior and how does that change in behavior actually tip or, or, or bend reality toward it? And I think, you know, if, not, if all of us stopped acting tomorrow, nothing would happen. So it's really consequential. Like, what is it that we believe? And as a result, what behaviors are going to stem from that? And how much does it tilt reality in one direction or, or another? And so as it relates to Bitcoin, I'm a believer, I guess you would say. Like, I'm all in. I'm here for the cause. I'm acting as if it's going to succeed. We're going to build a better world. We can have a better future. We can have healthier families. We can have peace in the world, all of those things. I'm acting as if that were true. And my, my faith, I suppose you would call it, is that in acting in that way, I tilt the scales a little bit toward that reality being true. And I think, you know, that's the, uh, that's the only way I can answer that question. So I'm going to shill the documentary as well. It's called Dare to Dream, and it's well worth watching. And John, of course, features in the documentary. Um, but please, surely some of you are losing sleep over this. I know, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm a Bitcoin advocate, a Bitcoin believer myself. But, you know, for the sake of argument here, is there something that, you know, Ella, you've been in this space since 2021. Like your, your resolve must have been tested a few times in this cycle. You're perhaps not in the Earth's core the way that Eric is or in the, you know, the outer core the way that Toma and John are. You know, what, what is it that concerns you about the future of Bitcoin and this pursuit of this global rise in consciousness? Yeah, and I think I'll preface that I, when I learned about Bitcoin, I also had to learn about money and energy and all of the other topics. I'm kind of got in when I was just learning about how the world works. So I feel grateful that I could, you know, have Bitcoin early on when I'm figuring out these topics. Um, on the language point, I think language is something that I'm really interested in. And I took a class on linguistics last year, another one this year, and how this is a longer topic, but I think Bitcoin can kind of go further in transmitting meaning that language itself can. Um, and this isn't my concern that I kind of thought of myself, but I was talking with someone the other day about seed phrases and how like, seed phrases they're in, I think Roman language or, you know, A, B, C, D, and I think that's a concern. Bitcoin is for everyone, but not everyone knows English or how to write or how to read, and so how that's a concern that I would like to see addressed um, going forward as well. Yep, I've seen that firsthand. Illiterate people will not get Bitcoin until we solve literacy. Or we get better solutions. Yeah. I'm so, cryptography can, can be implemented with sound. It can be implemented with color. Look, cryptography is about pattern recognition. And so there's multiple methodologies that I do okay, hope good. in time we will actually have Braille cryptography that will be able to help people in this way. So I, I just need okay. to point that out if that's possible to be solved. Good. We're ever the optimist. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Toma, before oh, we get yeah. to the last closing comments. I'm going to give, I think, the most optimistic answer of all of all of these, I have no concern at all about the future of, of Bitcoin. And the concerns, that, the concerns that are raised say, oh, look around, there's still so many people who aren't aware of it. There's people who can't pronounce it. There's people who are skeptics. Well, zoom out, roll the clock back 15 years ago, nobody knew about Bitcoin because it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, once, you know, like if you're thinking back to Michael Saylor's presentation a couple of days ago when you were here, he talked about the process that people go through spiritually and, and financially of, of going through it. And the, Bitcoin doesn't spread in a linear way. It spreads in an exponential way. I tell 10 people, five of them tell me I'm crazy. Three of them buy a little bit of Bitcoin. Two of them are on the fence. The five who bought Bitcoin, or the three who bought Bitcoin, I can't remember what I used in my example, they, they end up telling 10 people. And, and so you get this exponential growth because once you go through five or six generations of that, you're at this huge, huge scale because it's grown exponentially. We are now at a stage where Bitcoin, for many people who are long timers, they discovered it at Occupy Wall Street. Today, Wall Street has been occupied by Bitcoin, right? Like Wall Street is on board. Wall Street's biggest firms are all selling Bitcoin to everybody on Main Street. And that's just something that's happened in the last two months. What's going to be the next cycle? Where, where is it going to go? So it, it is expanding exponentially. And as it does, it changes and aligns and awakens and transforms everything that it touches. And I, I think this is part of what Michael was trying to get at in his presentation. And I may state it explicitly. The transformation, the awakening that we're talking about that's happening to us as individuals who are early to come, 
is going to transform all these other, other institutions because it's going to transform all the people in those institutions to become awakened as well. Yeah, and it's, it's well, on, well on course. Um, we're coming to our sort of last five minutes here. I just want to check in with you all. Has your consciousness been risen during this talk? Nodding, clapping, whooping, smiling. Right. Well done, guys. We're, we're globally rising the consciousness together. Um, before I, I turned up at the conference this morning wearing just a regular white T-shirt, and I thought ahead to my panel this afternoon and thought, no, I need some, the jazziest, most you know, psychedelic thing I can wear. But anyway, last five minutes, I would love it if you could share with the audience something that they can take home with them that will you know, make them think, make them perhaps reflect on this idea of a rise in consciousness. Eric, you are primed. Let's go. Look, like there's a very special opportunity for every single person in the audience here, particularly if on the fence. You can choose to take the orange pill and go down the rabbit hole and do the work to see where this goes and take it very seriously that maybe there is an opportunity to radically change consciousness in the most meaningful way, but it's going to be very, very difficult and hard and very trying at certain points in time because you will come headlong into your own nihilism and trying to understand why does this darkness exist? How can we change it? Why is Bitcoin the solution? And each and every question you have, there is an answer, but it requires for you to do the very real work and take each question very seriously. Or you can take the black pill. You can go back into that world where they tell you who you are, what you're supposed to do, work at your job, put money in your 401k, pray that it's there when you're 65, hopefully retire, and well, fuck your kids because there's nothing left for them or any social security. These are two options that you have, and they're the only two paths forward. I highly implore you to take the orange pill and see how deep the rabbit hole goes. But we only offer truth, nothing else. Toma, what takeaway? Well, with, with a little less intensity, it, it's the same spirit. <laughs> spirit. That goes it's, it's like, saying, mate. The, bi Bitcoin <laughs> is the first step that allows for the redemption and salvation of humanity. And in that, it's each and every one of you can be redeemed and saved uh, and through experiencing yourself. <laughs> and I, I, don't, I don't really know what more to say about it other than surrender into this movement that leads to your awakening and discovery of your true self and know that that is something that when, as you and other people around you become it, <laughs> you witness humanity at its fullest potential. I really like that, yeah. It, it ties into what we were saying earlier, you know, what is the purest form of you, what is the pure you, find out who that is and, you know, elevate yourself to that level. So, okay, so we've got take the orange pill, perhaps forcibly. We've got be the purest once, version. Once you take it, trust, surrender and receive the effects of the orange pill, is it? Trust and surrender Don't, don't resist the orange it. pill. Fantastic. Ella. Yeah, so maybe my answer won't really talk about Bitcoin in it, but I'll share just a very brief story. When I was in my freshman year of college, I, to bring up the concept of isolation, I was living by myself, I was physically alone, and I was watching a TED Talk, and it was Why 30 is Not the New 20 um, by Meg Jay, and she kind of laid out at the end some points, like, you know, when you're young, you think, oh, I have t another 10 years until I need to start acting or doing. Um, but she says, no, it's so important when you're, done, when you're young, go out, get some identity capital, don't worry about having an identity crisis, you know, use the weak ties in your network and just start. Don't worry about what you haven't done or what you will do. And so I think for people, you know, my age, younger, like, yes, community is everything. And just start, go doing something, figuring out what it is you value in life you know, what type of person do you want to be? And I think if you can do that, the rest will really fall into place and you'll, you'll get this more increase in consciousness later on. Yeah. Hey, here's that. Here, here. I wish I'd watched that video when I was 20 years old. I really needed that. The 20-year-old me needed that. I needed to get off Silk Road. <laughs> John. I, get, I guess one of my observations from doing that documentary that we referred to was you know, it was about the El Zante, uh, El Salvador story, and the, the three guys that were in El Zante, which if, if you guys don't know, it's like a, a place that time forgot, a little beach town in El Salvador, and El, you know, nobody gave a shit about El Salvador until very recently. And uh, they just decided, despite the violence, the murder, the war, they wanted to stay and dream again, and they wanted to allow others to dream in their community. And so they, for years and years, 
They did these social programs. They would teach five kids how to speak English. They would give surfing lessons to eight kids. And uh, they did this selflessly, humility, weren't looking for anything in return. And then someone came along one day and sprinkled a little Bitcoin on that. And so there's a couple of insights I derive from that. One, you know, there's a quote, I think it's Shakespearean, but I remember from Charlie in the Chocolate Factory. And it's at the end when, when Charlie has the everlasting gobstopper. Stopper, and instead of selling it to the bad guy, he gives it back to Willy Wonka. And he grabs it and he says, so shines a good deed in a weary world. And I think Bitcoin is allowed, it, it's kind of like the good guys are coming back. It's the return of the good. It's the return of the truth. And what I think the El Zante example reveals is that if you just do a little good, if you do a little truth for the right reasons in the, in the right way, you will attract that big force of good that's emerging in the world as represented and tethered by Bitcoin and as you know, expressed and held and shared and distributed and paid for by all of us, you will attract that to it. And so I guess you know, my, the, the advice or the insight I'd leave you with is uh, take, take hope. Good and truth are real things and they're re-emerging in the world today and Bitcoin is a massive part of that. So let that orient and inspire your actions is what I would say. So there you have it, everyone. I really hope these messages have resonated with you and that you go home and you ruminate on them and you let them percolate over the next few days. These are four of the brightest minds in Bitcoin and me. It's been an absolute pleasure and privilege to share this time with you all. Please do think about what they said and please do give it up for John, for Ella, for Toma and for Eric. Have a lovely rest of your day.